Good evening. Uh, my name is Okwe Ngwezo. I'm the director of House Kunst, and it's really a great pleasure to see all of you here this evening um, to help us um, welcome back uh, a great colleague, a great curator um, to House Econ Sabina Bright Visa. Um, you know, Sabine um, Bright Visa, as many of you know, is renowned for the important work she's done in the field of contemporary art, you know, particularly in the context of making available to many of us a new you know, field of understanding of art from the 60s to, um, shall I say, more concretely to an, a period um, in the 90s and um, the 2000s that one would say that many institutions at the inception of those practices, namely conceptual art, namely feminist inflected practices, we are not necessarily given institutional attention, but have since become touchstones for how we understand the map of contemporary art. And part of the reason we invited you know, Sabine um, is also to help us to understand the biography, so to speak, of the curator. Not necessarily the personal biography, but the intellectual biography of the curator. So this is the second in a series of annual conversations that we inaugurated last year. The first one was, was with my dear colleague Ulrich Vilmes, um, who for uh, certain exigencies could not be here this evening. And in that conversation, um, I not only learned so much about Uli's biography, but I came to understand why curators do what they do, the passion, the commitment, the form, of different forms of intellectual restlessness that drive the way we do what we do. So this evening, it is my hope that we can engage um, with Sabine's intellectual biography in a substantive way. And I'm very sure that it will be, uh, you know, in many ways an abbreviated version of that intellectual biography because the how career and the work she's done is so large and very big that we can't possibly discuss everything this evening. But let me introduce Sabine, as many of you know. Um, she, and is, you know, for me, it's very um, gratifying to learn that she came from the field of law. I came from the field of political science and literature. So, um, so it's gratifying to see that one can make this kind of lateral or shift from one discipline to the other and to excel in that work that one does. And Sabine became the founding director of the Generale Foundation in Vienna. That's really the way many of us got to know Sabine. I visited quite a number of exhibitions in uh, her building at the Generale, but what made the Generale Foundation even more important and incisive is the amazing collection that Sabine built during her tenure as director of Generale and the multiple exhibitions she organized. But one of the defining features of Sabine's exhibitions is that they are not just simply exhibitions, they are scholarly propositions, that they are oftentimes accompanied by the first comprehensive 
catalog or studies of in-depth studies of the work of the artist in question. And that made the publications by Generali Foundation highly coveted. And unfortunately, sometimes the print runs are not so huge that they become immediately uh, books that you have to search all over and pay enormous prizes for. But it really you know, speaks to the fact that an exhibition is not just simply that we go to see, it's a set of propositions and ideas that we, through the, the publications and other supporting material that we revisit time and time again and that become material for further research, for further thinking. And this is one of the things that this has distinguished you know, uh, Sabina's work. And of course, many of you kn here know that this collection was presented here in 2005 in House of Kunst. And um, the exemplary work of conceptual art from the 60s and 70s and the post-conceptual practices, again, um, um, moving into um, areas of, of performance and, and so on, you know, we're all part of it. In 2007, um, you, know, um, you know, Sabine made a shift to New York uh, to become, um, you know, the head of um, the Department of Media and, and Performance at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and of course, in a very short period of time, also left her stamp on the collection um, by really acquiring works by artists that had been long ignored or had not really been looked at in depth. Uh, how many um, works over the period? Hundreds? 800, okay, there we go. So she must have been a very busy bee, you know, so it's like she couldn't take no for an answer. If you know, in a bureaucratic setting, like, you know, huge institution with such incredible depth, what it takes to really to get a work acquired and talk less of 800. So it really speaks to the tenacity of Sabina's commitment to artists that um, she was able to accomplish that um, in, a, in a short period of time. So again, my, my introduction of Sabine is, will be very brief. I'm not gonna give you the litany of it because you're going to you know, see and go through with us the um, you know, different you know, uh, aspects of our career. But finally, um, we, are, we were all very delighted that Sabine made another move, leaving New York to become the director of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Salzburg. So she's nearer, and we've been talking a lot about joining forces, uh, maybe merging, becoming one you know, institution along this rail line uh, between Salzburg and Munich, between Austria and Germany. And so I am really, really delighted uh, that Sabine accepted our invitation to come here this evening. So please help me welcome Sabine. Thank you, Okui, and thank you for inviting me. It's a real true pressure and a an honor and privilege because I, as you know, adore what you have done. All your shows have been really landmark, the short century, and so many things you did uh, at the ICP and, and many more places, not even thinking about Documenta and Biennale. I think it's um, hard, to, uh, hard to cope with that. <laughs> I must say, it's really impossible. And I feel a little bit at home here, I must say, being uh, here at the Haus der Kunst. I've been talking to some people here who helped me to set this up, which is a video on uh, one of my first shows I did in Salzburg, actually, and some remembered when we did the exhibition here of the Generali Foundation Collection, that Simone Forti herself performing two sounds, and we don't have the sound, it would be, uh, maybe we can have the sound. It's hard to hear. It's, it's a sound which creates pain. It's by Lamonte Young, actually, and she's performing, she created this piece uh, for being able to listen to this kind of minimal music we barely are able to do. So that's Simone Forti, and you've seen some of the performances which uh, 
was one of my first shows in Salzburg in summer 14 during the time when we say the world comes to Salzburg because of the Salzburg Festival when we did a number of performances from a series which are called Dance Constructions which he started in the early 60s in the loft of Yoko Ono in New York in a series of concerts actually and we performed them in the city and in the museum and gave her the first uh, retrospective and um, and as Oki said, that's what I like to do. So I'm telling a little bit since I studied law, <laughs> why I did that and what I'm doing. And I have some notes, but I'm not really sure what I'm following. So um, what I'm doing, being a curator and a museum director, I'm doing for quite a while, actually more than 20 years, I figured out. So, um, and I'm always trying not to become not getting too much into routine. So I'm, I'm organizing exhibitions and uh, working with artists and colleagues because that's what we all do. We're working with art objects, but we're working with people, those that produce art, but those also that media art, criticize art, write about art, like me and Oki or many of you here in the audience. That's really something I love to do. <laughs> I must really say, I feel it's a great privilege to work what we often call in a very negative sense the art industry, but basically I think it's a real privilege to work in that field and not need to sit in a bank or in a whatever. I sit in a bank sometimes to get some money. So <laughs> not very successful in that. Um, however, it makes me feel I'm, I'm contributing something. It sounds a little bit idealistic what I will say, but it is some, something like that. It, it, it drives me, what really drives me that what Okwe tried to say, that I can offer something to the people or share with colleagues, but also with a wider audience, of course. We haven't been aware about that or haven't been able to see it in this context. That's something which makes me exciting and which makes me to work very hard because we also have to say uh, it's, a very hard, it's a very hard work. Um, what was the title of the exhibition of uh, I Don't Make Holidays of our <laughs> friend in Berlin, um, uh, the Fluxus, uh, René Block. I think there was a show about René Block's I Don't Have Holidays. I can sign that. I barely have holidays. If I have holidays, I, I work. So basically, I understand myself operating um, not only as organizing exhibitions, um, but also at publishing books, as Okwe highlighted. I think that's very important, that's a sustainable side, but also of acquiring artworks for a public collection. I think that's, that's very important for me, and I think that's most important. I do think museums are very important. Kunsthall and Kunstvereins are great, and it's important. They can be more experimental and try out certain things, but I think what I'm interested in, what I'm really going for, hello, is that there is something, we build something. We change, we change the landscape of our cultural history, of our cultural map by building collections. That, that's what I like to do. Um, and this is not something, obviously, a lot of people like me to do, <laughs> or they like me to help me to finance the resources I need to, I need to be able to do it. So I had no choice, in fact, to become a chief curator and a director. It's not something I wanted to. I just had no choice. I had to become a director in order to be on top of the resources to say, okay, I want to do this and that, I want to assign this money and that money to that, because this is important. So that's why we have to have power, so to say. And um, uh, yeah, and I also feel it's essential to build institutions. That's the other thing. We need, so we need money, we need space, and we need colleagues and collaborators, but we need, we need institution, we need infrastructure, we need, we need, we need a building, we need a staff, we need all this in order to be able to facilitate the artists and all what we knew. And so I'm, I'm a, I call myself an institution builder. I rather, so I had a very, quite a short period working at MoMA and usually I always say my colleagues, they die there on the desk, no one wanna leave because they feel it's the most important, powerful place they are and there can be nothing like that. I felt at some point maybe I'm losing my time, maybe I can do more because things are slow and maybe it's more important, my energy or my, what I'm interested is to be somewhere where it's not something like that, maybe I can contribute more. So that's something I'm thinking about a lot if I'm taking decision and they're of course strategic decisions. Um, 
I got no training, as Okri said, literally no training. I even, even if I studied law, I did not attend one of those many curatorial practice courses. So I have learned on the job and I had the privilege to be able to do that. So I could all do all these mistakes. I did them all, <laughs> all the mistakes someone needs to do in order to know uh, what would be better. And that was important. I had the situation when I started the Generali Foundation in the late 80s, no one knew me. Uh, I worked with architects, no one knew. We started a building, we had nothing to lose. We had nothing to lose. And I, I met everyone and talked to everyone and my colleagues were really generous and said, I think this and that would be needed. What do you think about that? And they were all were really generous. I could meet museum directors all over the world and they were so generous to give me feedback and share what they think about my ideas. So I could really test it. I had nothing, I was nobody. And I think this was great. I miss that sometimes actually. Um, I didn't study art history. I went there, and at that time, this was really after the so-called famous Wiener Schule. There was nothing. It was entirely boring. I found myself in a big place where they projected slides, and people were supposed to identify the artworks, and I thought, this is nuts. That's not meaningful, and I found it actually more interesting. I mean, it would have been probably, there would have been places to have a great education at art history at that time. Vienna was certainly not, but I, I also came from a background where I had, I had, I was aware I have to build a sort of basis. I had to make a living, and I, and law was a sort of a very general, generous education. So, like in former times, someone would study medicine or law. These were the two fields. Uh, philosophy wasn't even existing early on, and uh, it was interesting because this was in Austria at a time before what we call the Waldheim era, before 86, and the Waldheim era, when Waldheim became the Austrian president, this was important because suddenly people had to deal in Austria, which was... Uh, which understood, and Austria understood itself as the first victim of the, whole, of the Third Reich, not like Germany, which was a sort of um, bad, bad role playing. So before Waldheim, no one wanted to deal with that. So studying law means there was a real confrontation be between so-called leftists and the right people. And this was very tough. I learned a lot from that, I must say. This was interesting, so I got politicized, some would say. Um, after finishing studies, I had this one of those funny things that happens in your life is I met two Argentinian people who worked in experimental theater and they were running a sort of place uh, which was called Dramatisches Zentrum in Wien. Later I figured out Heimut Zubernik also worked there at that time, but we didn't meet each other. So I started to work in the night. During the day, I worked at courts to get some training. That's what you do after you finish your law degree. You run through several courts. So I divorced and all kinds of things. And in the night, we staged Beckett, Chenet, and all kinds of things. And this was fantastic for me, I have to say. It felt really, that's the place I want to be. I must say, the two people, they're not alive anymore. They both died from AIDS, and they had already AIDS at that time. So this was also something I um, became so, sort of with this problematic, which was an important subject in the New York, New York art scene at that time in the 80s, became very familiar. So this was formative to me, I must say. And we worked, you know, all these things you would do in the 80s. We staged Beckett and one of the actor was a so, sort of self-called hero of the so-called underworld of a murder. So it was like a sort of a real gene in a way. And it was quite amazing. So I learned a complete uh, different world, actually, which was existing, kind of an utopian space. So and after I finished everything, I had to decide what I'm going to do and met all my colleagues who, who applied, you know, in law courts in Brussels and all kinds of things to make a career. And I just didn't do anything, actually. I didn't do anything and was just waiting what's happening next. And I met some people who were running an art space and one who was running a gallery and both, for whatever reason, felt I should work for them. And I decided not to work for the commercial gallery, which was kind of a distinguished gallery in Vienna at that time, but decided to work for the artists, for an artist space, a space which was not existing at that time. 
And that's how everything started, because at that space, we certainly didn't have money. I tried to find money through companies. I met someone from Generali who wanted to start something in the arts. Oku doesn't know all this. <laughs> so, <he's a laughs> so I have it started, and then Generali kidnapped me at some point in order to start an art program. And at that time, it was, it was just me. I was the only staff. And I, I <laughs> so I did everything. The first thing I bought an answering machine. Do you remember answering machines? Phone answering machine? <laughs> because they all had female secretary. I had no secretary, so I thought I need a secretary. They didn't buy me a secretary, so I bought an answering machine. And they were so thrilled. They always left messages on my answering machines. Also, artists when they get their money. I have amazing, amazing archive on artists' messages and executive messages on these answering machines. So when I was working, uh, this was the beginning when Generali started to sponsor the secession to became an annual partner and there was a uh, president, Ilbert Köp, who was kind of very influential to get this started, to get private money for the art world, which was completely public and kind of frozen. And um, so there was an advisor board and, and after a while I made a little revolution and called another advisor board and soon after a couple of years I became the director and started to build a museum. That's the space Oak is talking about. And I'm going to stop this video and show you one of my first shows. I have some slides, I can't show them all, I didn't really, and that's sort of the thing. I have a lot of slides from my Generali period because someone did work through all the shows. Great. So that was my first office, actually, and that's Gerwald Rockenschau. But now I see it as the first performance I staged. <laughs> also, it was an installation. I, had an, I built an office. It's an office I built. It was in the third floor in the, what we call, so downtown Vienna, or first district Vienna. And I said, we have to start doing shows. We can't just buy art. We have to start doing shows. We have to work with the artists. That was just an impulse. So I asked artists to do something what we called at that time site-specific works. So to kind of works which relate, so not something they would do in the studio. So this was post-studio, they would do especially for this space. And as it turned out, a lot of artists, they just didn't do something for the space in a formal way. They referred to what the space is, which was my office as someone running a private art association buying art for an insurance company. So in Gerwald, what he did here, we had kind of a flexible space with moving walls because we also did meetings there and it had to be transformed in a few minutes. So what he did, he just cleared everything in the space behind there, also walls in the back, and just wanted to take in this picture with him moving one of the sliding walls. That was basically it. Then I show you the second one. This was Helmut Zobernik. Um, the show after, he produced these sculptures, this kind of hybrid between sculptures and bistro table, which is kind of a neoliberal furniture, as we learned, because that's the idea, you sort of have a quick lunch or you have a quick conversation, so this became very fashionable in the 80s, bistro tables. So he made these, which are paintings, and people, of course, didn't know what to do. Is this something you use, or is it a painting or a sculpture? I didn't even know it, actually. He also built um, stools, which he designed, and we, we paid that all. Also, we commissioned, we gave them a fee. Uh, we also built stools, which well, Anton Herbert bought later because Heimo decided not to show the stools, whatever. So, and I'm showing another project because what I learned, I learned from the artists. I got really formed by artists. I learned about art from the artists. Of course, I read also a lot and did all those things, but I think what the art needs and what my role could be. So that's another piece by Heimat Zobernik. That's the facade or in, in Vienna where we did the building. It's kind of sad because the building is closed and I'm the bad girl in this game. <laughs> Maybe some of you know. However, so when we did the building in a, in a hat, former hat factory of the end of the 19th century, uh, at that time it was very fashionable by an art organization called Museum in Progress. They're still very active to do fancy outdoor projects with artists. And I found this kind of um, interesting where this went and we said we want to also do an outdoor project. We have no money, how are we going to do it? So, so, so the, we used the normal net, the facade for construction site is covered, this cheap green net. I think it's not even used anymore because all facades are covered with commercials now because that's kind of a normal thing. And Heimo Zobernik painted the logo of the Generali Foundation, which is an extension of the logo of the Generali 
cooperation uh, by hand. So that's gigantic. You have to imagine this is uh, at least uh, 30 meters wide by hand. We, we, we rented the factory for that and stretched it according to the dimension of the real estate. So something you're certainly not allowed. You're not allowed to change a brand of a company or any brand by doing it not in a professional way, so by doing it by hand and even changing the proportion. That's a sort of no-go. So, I mean, this all looks, but working in a company which just launched their corporate design and all this new branding, it, it was quite interesting. And another project maybe some of you know is this project with Andrea Fraser. Uh, a project in two phases where uh, at a time when she sort of proclaimed uh, kind of provocative, I'm an artist, I'm providing service, so I'm not doing autonomous art, I'm providing service, I'm a service provider, and uh, uh, did several sort of uh, proposals how she can be hired. I hired her, I was one of the first one hiring her to do a study on the function of the art for the corporation and the result was a, a report a report uh, based on the design of the rep annual report generally companies doing was just stripped from all the images because they used the artworks we bought and I had quite a problem with that to decorate these their balance sheets basically so we we used the same design of course the content was uh, completely Bourdieu and Andrea Fraser's research was she's doing and it was completely uh, language-based, and you see here, we also did some charts, so this little thing, it's the holding of the art collection, that time, and that's the holding of the real estate collection. That, that was influenced by Louis Lawler, who did similar things like that in the 80s. So we, we were like these little two girls, we kind of broke into information we would not even usually get, but some we had to get out because it was not allowed. And, and she, she, so, Hi, it would be too long to speak about it, but what we also did, we took away the artwork from all the offices where they were originally be bought, because sort of in the interviews she was conducting with the people there, more or less the result was they, they just don't want it, so she took it out. So these are empty hallways and offices, um, and installed them according to the floor plan of the building, so not in an aesthetic structure as a curator would organize a show, but in a completely severe structure. So these are the executives' offices. Executives are always on top and the lower ranks are below. So it was like a walk, just we calculated the dimension. It was the first show, it was really embarrassing for me because first she showed all these works on paper we mostly bought only for offices. It was never meant to be the collection. And then she showed them even in a way, uh, however. So, <laughs> okay, so maybe I'm too long already. Okwe, you have to tell me. Um, yeah, I mean, what can I say? Uh, I like to do projects with artists. I also like to excavate things. So I did a lot of uh, retrospectives with artists where trying to go a little bit deeper maybe in those things. We always talk about and know, but we never see. So here we have a performance by Dan Graham, was one of the first shows, uh, and a big show where we produced this piece. This was also shown here, a video space, um, um, a display for showing videos, which is kind of a hybrid between an architecture and a functional piece. So a lot of things I, I bought recently I thought looked like furniture in a way. I don't know why. It's not that I have a lot of furniture. <laughs> or this kind of hybrid between functional and not functional. And I'm still in this discussion of post-war American abstract expressionism and 60s. And so, so that's kind of important. I'm born 62, so maybe that's the reason. <laughs> However, so that's a thing we're traveling, because uh, as I'm sure some of you know Dan Graham, he, he shows here and he had projects here. So he uses different types of glass, transparent glass, two-way mirror glasses, but also in this case he used punched aluminum as a reference to the video pixel. And he did it for his own show, but also for, I uh, early on acquired a huge collection of VR, video art, which no one did at that time. So, um, and... And I often did also some very strange things. I wonder, I wouldn't dare to do that today. I had a next show and I kept the same work in the show, just moved it somewhere else and turned it around. This was another show called White Cube Black Box, where opposite to this black box where we, where we staged uh, 
structuralist films and performances, and the rubber on the wall is a piece by Helmut Zubernick again, which was also used here partly to cover the design of the architecture in some way. But on the other side was again Dan Graham's video space, but turned around and looked uh, very different. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's very hard for me. I just wonder how I can browse through and find the meaningful thing. Is again, again, it's someone I showed at MoMA later. So this is an early show. Um, just trying to get along with this machine. I don't want to do it too quick. Um, at MoMA, I did a big retrospective with Isa, which combined this early period until the 80s and what she's doing now with the big assemblages. This is something I did yesterday night. I thought I have to prepare some slides. There are too many. What I also do, and I think this is a sort of not so much reflective practice, I do like to invite colleagues to create shows as guest curators. And I often invited people who have never done a show, or who are not meant to be curators, who come from different fields. And, uh huh, okay. How can I do that? I do this, yes? Okay. So I, I'd like to do that. And now I'm gonna go further. I run through that's a show I did in Barcelona, Modernology. So I'm also doing theme shows of, ah yeah, this I wanted to show because that ties in with the idea of the collection. So at MoMA, when I came there to be in charge of this department, I found myself in a huge uh, collection of video art, which was actually not processed. When they were always, I had these tons of interviews and they were screening me if I would be the right person and I was thinking about do you even want to do that or whatever. And never dared to ask if this video collection is processed because it would have been a little bit embarrassing. As I found out when I accepted the job, it was not processed, not catalogued and not even that, it was not preserved where I left a collection of similar size in Vienna which was digitalized and able to be accessible. So I found myself in a department where there were, you know, files of old DVDs. So what I did with my great colleague there, Erika Papanek, she did the really load of work. We digitized, we ne renegotiate rights because that's an important thing since I started law. I have this eye. If you buy artworks, you don't often buy a physical thing. You have, you have to think about what you are allowed, what, what's your permission uh, to do. So we, we worked all on that, which was a gigantic enterprise, and we developed with the artist Rene Green, which was actually, I think, the first African-American artist having a solo show at MoMA, in fact, a display how people can watch videos. So it's like an ongoing, uh, never-ending exhibition, and she made this Great display, they gave us a terrible place, I must say, space, like a hallway next to the restaurant. However, she made uh, this space form, poem for it, so she made this kind of flexible space where people could, uh, by themselves, using this iPad, and I want to do something similar in Salzburg, actually, which will open in summer, look through the entire history of video, select videos according to keywords or artists or dates and things like that. So this is, is sort of, um, I think, was probably one of the most important things I did there, also not so known because they took it away. And I also like to do, and that's maybe to finish crazy things, I must say. Uh, this is a project, since I was in charge of perf performance, and I had to deal with this, what I always call the post-Marina Bramovich trauma at the Museum of Modern Art, when people were queuing up to sit in front of Marina, the great Marina, which I do a lot, but I felt that's really the opposite. I always thought performance art and also media art it is, because it's definitely about the emancipation of the subject, the other, but also the audience, and she completely put it upside down. So one of the most controversial project I did was a, what was called a meta-monumental garage sale with Martha Rosser, which goes back to the 70s when she did garage sales in California, which is kind of a common thing, a garage sale, when someone moves, they sell their, you know, uh, things they don't want to move, in, in the garage, in front of the garage. But Martha made a whole thing about it. She sees it as a biography, as a history, as an archive, as a museum. And we did this at the Museum of Modern Art in the huge atrium. We collected, I don't know how many, 
tons of objects to process which had all to be frozen to be able to enter the Museum of Modern Art so they are not infected and so the starry night will not be whatever infected. By. And we sold literally works there. I sold a Mercedes there for 3,000 bucks. <laughs> um, and it was a beautiful installation and uh, after Obama got re-elected by the way, that's why we put up this big flag. And she even made it which was the worst thing that her art dealers, this is Che Gorni, even sold at the Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> so it's a really no-go. So a museum, of course, is something to preserve art. It's not about selling, but as we all know, especially the MoMA is selling, is deaccessioning, is the more elegant uh, term for it in order to improve the collection, there are certain rules. So, and this was a real crazy project, and Martha, you see herself here, was of course selling, you could haggle with her, which was not so successful often, and there's the Mercedes we sold, and yeah, maybe that's good to end here, huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Sabine, for that very generous introduction. And I must say, um, that's really the purpose of these conversations, because one gets to learn um, how a curator um, works. And I don't want to so much start with your beginning, but, but perhaps um, I want to ask you, um, Next to building cultural institutions, what do you think that exhibitions contribute to the landscape of culture? An exhibition, yeah, anything I would say, anything, it depends a lot on the exhibition, <coughs> on the artist. I mean, um, thinking now, we just took down our great show of Carol Schneemann, I must say I'm very proud of and it took me a long time to find partners for it, and I, didn't, I only find them now after. <laughs> because I always felt there's sort of um, a part in her work which is not known, and which uh, sh that she, her work is read in a very stereotypical way and not in a holistic way. So I always set myself different goals if I do exhibitions. There are always different goals. Um, and uh, which also makes me to do the exhibition. So a show, show is often about excavating an artist, excavating parts of works, like what I did with Martha Clark, looking at his drawings, at his conceptual part, away a little bit from the more spectacular part of his cuts into the building. He was so much known, but that he did this marvelous, wonderful, tons of drawings of errors just in, so coming out of choreography. So I think it depends a lot, but uh, that's sort of the thing. Do I look at things in a different way than I did before? I think that's sort of the goal. Basically, I want to contribute to discussion, to how we look at art, art movement, at periods. And yeah, and there's of course also often social sides of it. Um, but an exhibition as a, as a kind of cultural practice as something that signifies the, the idea that an artwork is not merely you know, a, a, a private object no. not to be consumed. Um, you know, this certainly w must have been your dilemma mm -hmm. at the Raleigh Foundation because your um, you know, task was to build a collection Sure. And, and now the question became the publicness of that collection. So this tension between the private and public became very clearly manifest in what you later did by transforming your office into an exhibiting or yeah, exhibition that's space. Right, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about this tension between the public and private and how that has manifested in your own work, in your own career, through the various kinds of negotiations that you've made? Uh, whether with artists or with institutions, with organizations, and more specifically, with a corporate body such as the yeah. Rally. Yeah, I think art has to be public. That's the first thing. But it's not only the art object, as you said. It's a discussion, the discourse about it. Um, I think that's important. Uh, and the sort of uh, freedom thinking, this kind of utopian space it provides, the art field, which I truly think. Um, Starting to work uh, when everything was public for a private company, building this was kind of interesting because in the beginning I had to explain everyone your work will not end in a 
corporate lobby, it will end in a museum. So I think you have to make you have to make some commitment for it. But of course, you always going back and forth. I mean, there's not the one or the other. As we know more and more, the things are blurring more and more. There are more and more gray zones, and it becomes. Um, also, our museums are not only be um, possible to run with public money only. I mean, these times are over, so we have to enter this private part and we have to negotiate and find out ethical ways to deal with it. And there's this question of hegemony, of course, thinking about powerful institution like MoMA, which is now buying from my shows the large things and I'm buying the small things, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. And that happens everywhere, that happened before and now again. So you you have to, um, and at the same time, uh, yeah, I mean, there's this constant negotiation of the private and the public. I think is not is not one line or not one answer. It's a co it's a constant um, negotiation with it and finding your individual path in that moment. W when did you really realize that this is what you wanted to do? Mm -hmm. Want to do. Good question. Sometimes I, uh, every day I think I stop doing that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe when I built this space, actually I always thought in the beginning I built this space and then someone else will run it, and then I just had to do it. I just started to do the shows, and I had it was so uh, challenging, I must say, uh, uh, but also inspiring to work with artists and talk with colleagues about what I'm into, what to find. I found it so much more uh, rewarding than working in a normal daily job. I mean, as I, I said, I really, I didn't only study art, I worked one year at the court, you run through different courts, so private courts or, uh, you know, really, what we say, Strafgerät also made it up to a high one, and you encounter these amazing things, and I, I probably had also kind of idealistic aspiration and realized this is not going to happen there, actually, and I felt kind of lost because I'm also kind of a person um, who, um, it's very important for me so I can, uh, um, I'm in control of myself, actually, and I felt in these structures you so become so much a little bit a robot of these guidelines and all those things. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I'm very interested in what you <laughs> said, that one of the reasons you wanted to be a director is because it's, it's not like kind of empty power, <laughs> 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 but, but the power of nomination, if you will. The, the idea that you said this is important and this is worth preserving. This is what you know, collecting in the public interest, mm -hmm. not 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 just simply as a manifest manifestation of your own taste. Um, no. And 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 when you decided with the idea of building a collection, what was the central motivation for the kinds of work that you wanted to collect? Was it based on interest or was it based on things that you, you thought were worth preserving that you didn't see elsewhere? There was not so much a strategy in the beginning, it was one step after the other. I, I, I mean, even also starting a library, a public library came out of the situation that I didn't get the books in Vienna I needed and then I bought them and then everyone called me up if they can get my books. So I thought, okay, I have to make a public library. I can't facilitate that anymore. I need to hire someone. So that's why we started the study center actually. And the same a little bit with the collection. We, I was talking to people about art, this and that, and you couldn't see it. And then I was, uh, you could couldn't see it, and I, I thought, and why is this not in a collection? What happened to it? And even the artists sometimes didn't know if they still have it and in what condition. And so it, it came out of a, a necessity. And of course, my I became interested why those things are not there yeah. and why this is not shown. Yeah, I, mean, but I, I want to sort to go to the question because there's an incredible coherence. I don't to, know, you see that. There's an, there's an incredible that. coherence to the collection <laughs> that you built. And in a sense, you know, that it's, it, when, when one looks at the Generali Foundation, you know, um, collection, uh, it's not merely a seminar on certain types of practices. It's a history, in a sense, yeah. that, was, that was being constructed. And I was just wondering that when did it uh, you know, occur to you that this was becoming a history and therefore needed further elaboration. Yeah, it becomes also kind of um, 
an obligation, to be honest, because when I started to show a lot of women artists which didn't have a presence, a lot of women of the 60s and 70s were expecting, I'm the one who is doing their, finally, their retrospective, and I couldn't do them all. So, <laughs> it, yeah, but as to many, and you could only look up into what you can't do, actually. I don't think it's so coherent. I'm always surprised if people say it's so coherent because I see the fractures and what is missing. So, and it's interesting for me if people relate my work so much to conceptual art because I mean, I'm a good friend of Larry Wien and I bought his films from MoMA and we have a piece at the museum, uh, beautiful, which we're not allowed to put up. But I never showed Larry Wien, for instance. I never did Daniel Buren. So I always did the I did Adrian Piper, so yeah. Goran Tribulak from yeah. Croatia. I always did the other mm. in a way. Yeah. So, um, or a lot, maybe, I would say. And I don't know, maybe that's in my DNA, I don't know. No, we're, but there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely bound to be, yeah. you know, gaps and, you know, missing histories or, or things that, you know, that never really made it into your orbit, but nevertheless, you know, the sense of coherence, um, I, I mean, is in, in a much more, um, you know, discursive mm -hmm. and in, in terms of mapping out um, a theoretical field. Yeah. You know, that this, this kind of, there's, a, there's a field of operation that one can, you know, look at and enter into and to say, well, the relationship between, you know, practices that emerged, you know, uh, out of conceptual systems and practices that emerge in opposition to them, mm -hmm. that they are much more of course, yeah. you know, sentient in terms of performance, the work yeah. of women, the critique of, of certain forms of domesticity, you know, the, the use of the, of the body as, an, um, as a kind of topos, if you will, uh, of, 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 of power and subjectivity. All of those things are collected in your work, and it's, it seems to me that um, that there are very few curators who are, you know, not specialists who have this kind of very incisive, mm -hmm. um, you know, approach. And you've, collect, you know, you've continued that. So yeah. how do you see the relationship between what you did in Vienna, New York, and now in Salzburg? Is, is this triangulation, is it meaningful for you? Yeah, and we, yeah. It's a, it's, I'm continuing, always on different terms. I mean, I'm continuing in a way, I'm doing still, I mean, I have a platform now where I can mul do multiple shows at the same time, so I can take risk as a, at, at a place of Salzburg where no one thinks this show even should be there, I'm always <laughs> told. Yeah. So I do that and I can do, you know, other shows in parallel. Uh, but I continue, I might continue to work with certain artists, but, but I'm expanding, of course. I have, I'm also working a lot with young artists, by the way. We mm. have an upcoming show where we produce 10 new works by mm. contemporary mm. artists. Mm. I love to do that. Um, no, I think it's a continuation, but I'm expanding and I'm getting my, of course, we grow older, we learn. Uh, as I learn on the job, I had more jobs, so I learned more. <laughs> so my vocabulary became larger and more multifaceted, mm. probably, of course. Mm. I learned a lot at MoMA, mm. actually, strategic wise. But I was able to be this little cell there to add uh, what I think they're really thankful to buy all these, you know, conceptual art from Latin America, large media installation, where the, it really goes back to the history and the origin what medium performance art was and meant to be and not the more sort of soft, entertaining version we often confront it. What, uh, what surprised you the most at MoMA? Pardon me, what? What surprised you the most? I what mean, this, this me legendary most? institution. What surprised you the most? That I could do that all. <laughs> 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 that I could buy this. I must yeah. say, because Chris had a conversation once with me in Berlin, and he started this, Chris Durkin. Ah, you worked at the museum where the trustees tell you what to buy. And I said, this is just bullshit. It's actually the opposite. I must, mm. Not that I'm here to defend American trustees, but I must say there's an amazing committee of Latin American art, and I could buy things amazing they mm. were and they were thrilled i brought up david lamellas or martha minuchin or lea lublin i bought that all and they were applauding and standing up and giving me more money so there it is it is there's not a good and a bad system mm. they're good and bad people maybe and i yeah. could 
for a certain time work with the system. I'm proud whoever sold a Mercedes at MoMA, <laughs> I think. <laughs> and that was a condition of Martha. Yeah. She said, this is a crazy work. I only do it if you bring me a car. I want to sell a car there. And that's a, you can't put a car at MoMA with an engine because of the fuel. So mm. it's a donation of a colleague, by the way, who... So of all the shows you've done over these years, I mean, I think it's since the, since the late 80s uh, to now, um, are there, you know, particular ones that, you know, um, that surprised you or ones that you felt that were failures and the ones that you, mm. um, you, know, you know, shall I say, remains very resonant in the sense that it's marked Mm -hmm. you know, your curatorial identity? It's difficult. I mean, there are many shows where I tested things, uh, for instance, with Krasinski, Edward Krasinski, just because that's kind of another interesting curatorial practice, which is talked a lot more now, is an artist who always showed his way in a very special work. And when I started to decide to do this show, he just died. He was already very old. So I thought, what am I going to do now? Uh, so I went to Poland, it was terrible cold, I still remember, and I found this huge archive of photographs and I realized this artist always commissioned photographs of his shows and I found out the shows are kind of very special, like mise-en-scene, so I decided to reconstruct certain mise-en-scene. So that was another thing I tested. Was, so I, always, I have to always find a trigger for me, so I'm interested to do this. But I think the project, I always feel, and maybe it just happened because yesterday, she got an award, it's a project with Andrea Fraser. also it was the toughest project and probably the worst attended project. <laughs> <laughs> but she got yesterday the Oscar Kokoschka award, Andrea in Vienna, and it was so, the day before yesterday, it was so funny for me yeah. now, because yeah. they hated us for this project. I mean, yeah. there were this article, I thought like, I have to leave the country or the, con the world yeah. or whatever. But it's still, I know there's still students want to see me to talk about this and I think it, put up, and it's still controversial, even in my role now, it's so much identified. What I'm doing also that I brought the Generali Foundation collection to Salzburg and then Andrea showed that. I, I, I was coming to that. <laughs> the bad story continues. <laughs> yeah. And I have this ongoing um, exchange with Andrea, of course, all my life, mm. probably El McCollum recently said, and when is the next project with Andrea are you doing? And so, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in this kind of really challenging people, but I think that's a project I felt um, at that time when there was this shift, talking about the private and the public, how art institutions can be funded, how they operate, how's the status of the so-called autonomous art or the independence of us, this went to a point which was really interesting, what Andrea did in a very provocative, self-exploitative way. She understands it today as a performance, mm. actually. I mean, we look at this project every five years from a different angle, and I, I think it, that was interesting. And also this very severe report, I mean, I'm, and also to go through this whole process, um, the research we did in this uh, cooperation and, and sort of, uh, it, it was quite I, amazing, I must yeah. say. I, I'm kind of curious by what you meant by the post waldheim period <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in Austria. That's a really and, awesome and, and, thing. Uh, uh, how did that relate to your practice? What, 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 what did that do? What, you know, was it a, um, a liberate in, um, moment or was it a moment of questioning or a moment of, what was it? Well, suddenly uh, everyone talked about it because Waldheim, as we all know, said he didn't go there. He, it was his horse, <laughs> famously, uh, participate in the war as an SS officer. And uh, um, so, and people, you know, voted for him. There was this outcry. We, we don't uh, let other people say who should be our president. So suddenly it was on the table. The Austrian had to deal with it. Well, I did this project with Hans Hake called Mir San Mir. Yeah. We're in Bavaria, everyone understands. We are who we are, mm -hmm. where he used the poster as a film poster of the 30s of a real fascist film mm -hmm. and made a montage with... This was at the time when we had a government built from the conservative political party and the right-wing party under Haider, but Haider couldn't be the, uh, the vice 
chancellor because this would have been, I mean, there was all this ongoing thing, however, so we did this project. And this was possible with Generali. I remember I had a conversation with my boss, who was the president of the foundation, but the CEO, and I said, I want to invite Hans Hake. This is this is, and that guy. Do you think I, we're going to survive that? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and I showed him something and said, oh, okay, let's do it. And, uh, and, uh, and then the project proposal came, which was much more problematic than we ever thought, because we got sued, actually, by the FPÖ. I don't know if everyone knows. Oh, no. It was, we we uh, consulted with the law, what could happen. I mean, we had to do that. And uh, at the end, they only found that the poster we used by Haider was a mountain in the south of Karinte, where he was a provincial governor, the so-called caravan, and Hake used them. So we sued, they sued us, we are not allowed to use the image of this mountain, which was so ridiculous. <laughs> and we lost. You but lost. Yeah, we lost, but we could stand that. It was interesting. <laughs> Hans has to do a piece out of it. <laughs> hey, but, but this made me, I think it made me, I mean, this may be this critical practice of someone like Gerwald Rockenschab, which was maybe a little bit different, maybe a very simple uh, gesture, could say, to mm. clear the space and show just the flexibility. Mm. What he showed is actually that the art space is not private and public anymore. It's all movable, as you would read it yeah. now. But Heimo said there's a function. This is not an exhibition space. It might have a function, and the object might have a function. It's not just an autonomous object. So I kept keeping... I'm still interested in this, because it's still the same, actually. Mm. And someone with Hans, who works what he called in the 60s real-time systems, mm. and turned it, it and, and we're going to do a poll, by the way, in the oh, next show. Okay. We're working on that. Fant I'm, I'm because we a, a new I, poll. <laughs> yes, we do a new poll, a Salzburg poll. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I bought an early poll of Hans, so yeah. we're going to revisit that. So, so to, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. You learn something. You, of course, experience your limits, challenges. You end up having all kinds of problems, of mm. course, and uh, sometimes... I, I'm wondering, you know, if you can talk about what has changed, because you, you mentioned the idea of the art industry, you know, by which one can say, okay, the art system. And, it, and, and, and oftentimes, uh, I think it's possible to make a distinction between the art system and the art market. And that there's oftentimes a conflation of the two and that they're not the same thing. And of course the art market is part of the art system, you know, but really they're, they're, we're really talking about a network of different practices, mm. uh, in, you know, non-profit, institutional, alternative, so many different, you know, discursive, pedagogical, uh, so many different models that really, um, you know, um, come together and sometimes, you know, part ways in this particular art system. How do you sort of, to, you know, see your, your work today in a moment when the so-called art market is ascendant, is the art market is, quote unquote, very, very present. Mm. Have you really been, you know, have you ever been influenced by the art market in doing what you're doing? Probably, I don't know, I guess, why should I not? Yeah. I mean, I said uh, recently, the art market is not just bad. Art mm. dealers are not bad, galleries are not bad, they're good people. Um, I don't know, I've been influenced. I certainly influenced the art market, I could say, because if I excavated 500 drawings by Martha Clark and I see them still, and they've all been sold, yeah, so that was a, bit a, yeah. a frustration. <laughs> you think, are you doing something amazing? You have all this yeah. idealistic uh, motivation and suddenly, and I will rem still remember the opening when the dealers came and they looked at it and priced it, and I thought, and I didn't even think about this, that I'm producing goods, mm. actually, by excavating it, contextualizing it, publishing it, cataloging it. This yeah. was sort of an, a real, um, yeah, I, I didn't really think about it, actually, in, in so before. So there are different forms of value that one Yeah, you create a value. Someone but makes money out of <coughs> <coughs> And we, can, we are not allowed to get a percentage, yeah. <laughs> which well, is I, good, yes. But, but, there, but there's, also, there's also cultural value, there's some course. cultural value, and these are sure. not things that are so easily monetized. No, of yeah. course not, and yeah. It, but, but, but let me just simply ask you about the, 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 this, you know, this question about the Generale Foundation collection moving to Salzburg mm -hmm. because it's so much identified with you. And, uh, you know, um, 
How have you dealt with this sense of dispossession, so to mm -hmm. speak, of the collection from Vienna and moving it to... Um, well, I also left it behind when I moved to New York, yeah. and I thought I'm finished with it, but I kept working with some of the artists, of course. Mm. Well, um, that's a long story how, why, you don't want to know why I did it, right? <laughs> no, 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 not in detail, not that's at complicate. all. That's complicated. I, I don't own it. It's a public collection, and that's why I brought it to Salzburg in order to preserve. Uh, that's the thing. And there have been, I also had a successor, and she also bought works, for instance, by Ree Morton, which we're going to install mm. soon. So there, it has a, an ongoing history, and it has been formed by many people who have been in the advisory board. Um, Benjamin Buchlo have been highly important to me, being in the board, also Kaspar König, who generously shared many artists I didn't know at that mm. time. Um, yeah, I think it's a public collection, that's where it should be, and the interesting thing is, also people say it's so special and so whatever, uh, so brainy or whatever you want, that it's a real success because we mm -hmm. dedicate the floor to it, which we rotate twice a year, and it's uh, actually sometimes, even with shows by Carolis Schneemann, the best attended floor. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the first floor and people are just too lazy to go up. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Several reasons, but people are coming to see it, and they see it, and I, of course, before I took this decision, which was a hard decision, I consulted also with artists, and they wanted it. They wanted that the collection is visible and be shown mm. and be on the safe side. Mm. And I don't own it, and I, I don't know how long I'm going to stay there. It's a contract which is with the government and not, not tied I, I, to I, me, I, for I, instance. I, are you able to add to the collection? Yes, yeah. where we, I'm in charge of acquiring. We bought great works by Simon Forti. We just bought uh, Hans Hack again. <laughs> <laughs> so we do buy. We do buy on a small scale, but I can. And um, really a small scale, but also the budget was small before. Now, the problematic now is with this sort of policy of the collection, what was once excavating hidden say, protagonists of the 60s and 70s became a major agenda for major museums now. So I'm, in fact, competing with more, more Tate or Pompidou now, which mm. is impossible when yeah. it comes to fundraising. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so I was asked recently whether I should change my strategy. I don't see it because also looking that contemporary art is even more expensive. And uh, I, I think there's a sort of line which has to continue there in a way. And um, yeah, and I, I do it also again in context with the shows we're doing because to buy artwork is not like shopping. You really have to know, you have to have time to do research, uh, to read a lot, to talk to the artists, to work. So if you do like work on a large show and we were also able to buy works by Carol Schneemann, to, you have to know what is really the important thing. It's not something that yeah. happens. So it's a good, it's a good, um, way to do it in connection with an exhibition. So it's a real, in a way, it's a real merge now because the museum is funding the exhibition, but the museum doesn't have money to make major international purchases, so it's done by Generali and it ends up there. And actually Generali gives also money to the museum to buy works which we own. So we bought, for instance, Rainforest from mm. the EAT show. Yeah. So I saved money of three years. Yeah. So which we is a fantastic, you know, yeah, fantastic exhibition. Thank you. Really yeah. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So we, we keep going. And I think you always have to a little bit the nose, as we say in German, early in the wind and mm. the others, which becomes more and more difficult, I must yeah. say. There were just so if so someone has money. So many <laughs> questions I want to ask. Um, you know, Sabine, and we, you know, we could just stay here all night.